welcome friends on this final and third day of this three day event we had here i'm very happy to see you again and to tell you that it was a great pleasure to spend time these three days with you sharing my experiences with a perfect living master great master hazur maharaj baba saban singh whose photo is here everything i've shared with you has come because of this man that one man a regular farmer in a small town doing farming on sugar cane growing sugar cane for his living should be able to transform the lives of thousands of people by simply talking a few words giving what they call initiation and giving them experiences nobody else could have given how can one human being do that the reason is from outside he is a complete human being he lives like a human being totally like an ordinary human being but his awareness what he is seeing and knowing at all times is right everything that can be known it's an amazing thing to have in a human being that in one human being who is here physically in awareness is also at astral causal plane and in true home such can be all of us are one so he is aware that we are all one not says we are one is aware this kind of awareness is so immense we cannot compare it with anything what happens to our state of being beyond our mind no language can write it i do not know any language of the world that can describe something where we can say how we live in a zero time zero space universe a universe that has no space and time yet has love and joy company how can that be our whole concept is different here that is why nobody has ever described there is no possibility of description no words exist all words all languages are based upon the life created in the three worlds of the mind and illusion of the maya that's all so that is why mystics and saints have come and made stories stories like our life here they try to describe the higher regions like they are something similar to what we are having here but there really no similarity at all it's not possible to describe those things that is why they have to make some stories stories there are some people describing the amount of light that the amount of light keeps on increasing as you go to higher levels is thousand suns is 10000 suns is million suns trillion suns that's how they're describing just the intensity of an experience but you cannot describe light that exists there with any light you see here there no combination at all i was reading last night an article sent to me by somebody that light which was considered to be a uniform constant the light that we see light that comes from the sun all light is just a flow of photons and when they flow they have a rotation which they call the angular momentum of the light new light has been discovered only few days back with half the momentum of the regular light they are going to find more types of light but the light that we have inside cannot be described here they doesn't exist here this is a copy of the original light which cannot be described similarly there is a copy of original creation which cannot be described this is a copy of what happened in our true home which cannot be described so we make stories i tell you stories all the time and i know they are stories but it's just to give a make a little comparison in what we are having here and the differences that we can experience 
but it's not possible to really describe everything that exists beyond the mind. Up to the mind, yes, you can describe. The mind has developed language, and therefore the mind can express itself in that language. Above that cannot be described. Seth Shivdyal Singh, known as Swamiji of Agra, from where the Radha Swami movement started, he describes the true home having tall trees, several miles tall, laden with jewels, diamonds, rubies, sapphires. He's describing them because a lot of his audience were women <laughs> and they loved the jewelry. It's just a way of showing you there is something very attractive there which you can't describe here. But to just enlarge the size of the trees and to put some jewels on that gives you some picture, a physical picture. So we are always trying to imagine that this situation we are in at higher levels of awareness is something similar. So we have been using these allegorical things, comparisons with the physical world. But I wanted to share with you that they cannot be taken literally. These are stories that have to be made just to make a point of what there is. To recapitulate what I have been saying to you, the whole truth, the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, the ultimate creative power is all lying within us. Nothing is outside. Nobody has ever found it outside. Nobody is likely to ever find anything outside. Everything has been found by the ultimate truth inside. Ultimate truth means that which is un not unchanging, truly real. And it's all comprised of the self. Here, when we sit in the physical world, we identify ourselves with the coverings of our mind, senses, and body. It is ourself. We might also say we have a soul, life in it. This is a definition of self. What will be the definition of self in a true home? It includes the whole of creation. There is no creation outside of the self where we are a true home. It's very difficult to understand that nature of a self. Some people think we go to true home, we leave other people behind. There will be no other people to be left behind. Everything has been created right in our true home. Everything is right there. Now imagine a disciple or a master who is continuously living in that state, even in a physical body, with that awareness of the true home. What a remarkable experience that is. And the beauty is, we are all qualified to have the same experience. They say there is a philosopher's stone. When it touches iron, it becomes gold. That's the philosopher's stone. It's often mentioned in Indian literature also. But a perfect living master is a different kind of philosopher's stone. When he touches iron like us, he makes it into philosopher's stone, not into gold makes it him to himself. A perfect living master, when he initiates us, he guarantees we'll be exactly like him. Not in body form, not in sensory system, not in karma, not in our mind, but in our entirety, we'll be like that. It's a very big promise. If you go within and reach those heights, you will find perfect living masters have always kept their promise. You can check it out about masters keeping their promise. It's not a small thing. Therefore, if somebody were, somebody were to ask me, what is the greatest thing that can ever happen in a human life? I would say the greatest thing would be to have the darshan of a perfect living master. To be able to see a perfect living master once. What happens if you see a perfect living master once? You are guaranteed to be initiated by a perfect living master. May not be immediate, maybe next life, maybe a couple of lives later, but it's a guarantee. That is why if you know the value of the darshan of a master, that means look at his face. 
just to go and look at the face of a perfect living master changes everything it means we are now going to be initiated by a perfect living master it's a very big thing what would be the next best thing that is to advance the initiation and to be initiated by him in this very life is the very best thing also initiation by a perfect living master is not teaching how to meditate it has nothing to do with teaching meditation at all it's a connection the master establishes between the seeker and himself internally inside the third eye center inside where they say is a thousand percent lotus great lights where the master establishes himself and is available to the disciple after initiation at all times 24/7 initiation is something very different we sometimes feel that the formality of telling us how to use certain words for repetition how to hear the sound inside is initiation that not initiation anybody can do that it means nothing the real thing is a master connecting himself to our inner self and permanent connection eternal can never break even if you try you can't break it it's so permanent that is initiation i remember very interesting incident i was young and we were standing outside the door of the great master who was coming out of his house an old man almost in rags torn clothes carrying a little bag on his back like this of his clothes or belonging came running and when i was standing he dropped the bag and ran great was just come out and he threw himself in the ground and put his head on the great master's feet and said please initiate me he said give me naam the great master said what once again and it is the first time he is seeing great master he very words immediately what once again then we heard the story the great master and that man the man had heard about great master in his village a month earlier from somebody and great master appeared in a dream and said you are marked soul and i will take you home just in a dream he said i must come and see you he said you are welcome come to have darshan the man was so poor he could not even afford a bus fare and he walked all the way it took him almost a month to come stopping at every place like a beggar such a poor man comes and goes to the great master begging for naam which he had heard from a satsangi other satsangi of his own village and great master says what once again and he explained you were initiated a month ago when you had the dream you were initiated that day so far as formality is concerned i will tell you tomorrow and next day he gave him the words of simran five words to repeat and how to listen to the sound inside explain next day then he told us we who were present that initiation is done independently of the teaching it is done for marked souls who are these marked souls since a human being becomes a perfect living master and can have a limited access to people so from time to time these masters appear they appear where there are seekers they don't appear out of nowhere they are ordinary human beings in whom the awareness of the highest comes up and we call them perfect living master before they are perfect living master they are like ordinary human being like us it is not that they are born like master like some people believe that perfectly was the born like that not at all they can manifest in anybody
Any human being can become a master. When the awareness comes, generally it comes from a predecessor master saying, you will carry on my work and the awareness starts. Sometimes awareness can take time, even after that. But it's an ordinary human being with an ordinary karma, ordinary destiny, who's made into a master because of his awareness of the top. And that is why these masters appear where there are seekers. And they come for those seekers. There are some seekers who are ready to go back to the true home in this very physical life. And there are others who are marked to be initiated by a perfect living master, but are not ready because of the burden of their karma and other things to go immediately back home. And they can either go slowly by stages and not come back in human life, or they can go into a second human life, third human life, maximum in the worst case, fourth human life. And then they can be initiated by a perfect living master at that time. They are initiated by a perfect living master in every life. It's not the same master. They have, masters have died, they are still born, new masters have come, but they are taken care of by a perfect living master in not more than four lives. Now I tell you a little personal story of my father. One day, my father could not attend a discourse of great master. But the satsangis who heard the discourse told my father that great master said today, if you are initiated by a perfect living master, you cannot have more than four human lives. You will be taken out, out of this. And my dad said, that's not fair. In the evening, we used to have a meeting and that my father was present with the great master. And he said, Master, I understood today in your satsang, in your discourse, you said that once initiated by a perfect living master, you cannot have more than four lives. Is that true? Great master said, Lake Raj, that was my father's name. Lake Raj, why are you worried? This is your last life. Why are you worried about four lives? He said, no, I'm worried because I may like a fifth one. <laughs> and great master laughed and he said, why would you like to have a fifth one? And my dad said, I understand sometimes masters keep coming back. If you are going to come back in the fifth life, I don't want to go back in the fourth. <laughs> anyway, it became a joke and they all laughed. Now, I was also sitting there with my dad and we were 10, 12 people there. Then great master addressed us. He said, when a perfect living master initiates a disciple, he takes into account the load of karma he is carrying. And load of karma is our own actions performed with our free will in several past lives. The law of karma is very strange. It is not that you can do one thing in one life and it's finished in the second. It can accumulate. That is why there are three types of karma. One is called pralabdha, destiny with which we are born. The destiny determines where you will be born, who will be your parents, who you will meet, where you will have accidents, where you will have sickness, where you will have rewards, where you will die. This whole life is destiny and we call it pralabd. That means it's fixed for this life. You come born with this. In Indian quotes they say, pralabd pehle bane, pache bana shreer. The destiny is formed completely before even the conception of the body takes place in the mother's womb. And the conceived egg of the soul, the destiny is ready, builds inside the mother's womb according to that destiny already prepared. The person may be walking outside is not even dead and destiny for the next life has been made. In the fifth month of pregnancy of a woman, the embryo becomes, the fetus becomes a living fetus. In the fifth month, 
that person is no longer alive anywhere else is alive in the mother's womb after that when he's born it's a new body same person karma that is pranab is made totally in advance and those events are all placed in our life already and we live it everybody lives it masters live it most enlightened people live it nobody has been changing that pranab or the destiny we are born with but then destiny covers several events leaving gaps in between most of our life nearly 70 80% is pranab destiny but the remaining 15 20 30% that is left gaps there that is where we use free will we don't use free will for everything we just there happen to be there going along we are born no free will where we will meet accidents no free will who we meet and somewhere no free will very little some choices come up in the middle and when we use our free will to make a choice between different options that creates a new kind of karma we call it karman karma or new karma which will have a consequence later on so pralabd is destiny karman is our ability to use choice making and create new karma karma is created not by action karma is created by intention to act supposing you have an intention to act i am going to kill that person and then you say no no i can't kill the intention to kill has already registered a karma the in intention not to kill has registered a second karma first one was bad second one not too bad good you reversed it both are independent acts of karma and they both carried forward in the law of karma there is no atonement and people think that there is atonement they think by doing good deeds by doing lot of charity and giving things away to people we are taking away our old karma no it doesn't work like that and big, big mistaken notion you know indian history of the old masters and avatars the case of lord krishna avatar of vishnu a story is told that when he was very young he was very enlightened even in his young age very young even as a child he had lot of wisdom and he talked about lot of wise things but he was born with this karma to be a cowherd he took care of the cows of the village imagine a person who could give the biggest discourses as given in the gita should be taking care of cows but that was his destiny pranab when he took care of the cows a friend of his used to accompany him whose name was udo childhood krishna and udo were very good friends and the recorded story says one time krishna was there in the, in the fields cows were grazing and udo was next to him and krishna said udo the law of karma is very strange nobody understands it and there was an ant crawling at that time and he pointed to the ant and he said look at this ant it's a little insect this ant has one time been brahma the creator of this universe this ant has one time been indra a lord of one of the big heavens in the astral plane because of his karma is an ant after that how can one reach that height because of good karma became brahma these creative powers are also souls like our souls these big gods and goddesses we worship are also souls like us by good karma they have taken those positions when the karma ends they come back karma doesn't work like we think it does it is ascent to the status of a brahma the creator did not take the karma away of his the same soul wearing the costume of a ant and you know, crawling there this incident has been reported so often i went to the area where krishna and udo lived 
just to see, just to have a feel. And they were farmers there. In the evening, they would sing together. Maybe they smoked something. I don't know whether the ecstasy they had with the smoke or with <laughs> or what they put in that, but, but they sang with great enthusiasm. I sat with them and I said, what are they singing? The refrain of the main song they sang was, it was in their accent, their language, Are udho karman ki gat nyari said. That was what they, the words were. Udo, the nature of karma is very strange. That is the refrain of the song. And it's all related to that event, that karma is like that. It cannot have any atonement. You can do very good deeds in a life, entitling you to one month's stay in heaven, in the astral plane, in Swarg, heaven. And you've done some bad deeds, saying go to hell one month. Both will take place. One has not cancelled the other. Therefore, we have to pay for our karma, good or bad. Now, sometimes I ask my friends, supposing you have that kind of karma, that you have to spend one month in hell and one month in heaven, and you are given a choice. And a choice is given, by the way, at the time of death. Because you will start with that before you have a rebirth anywhere. Hells and heavens are covered first. Supposing you are given a choice, would you like to go to heaven first for one month or hell first? And they give me different answers. I want to put to you this question. If you were to given a choice that you have to go to heaven for one month and hell for one month, how many of you would like to go to heaven first? How many hell first? Majority go to hell. <laughs> so isn't it amazing you're choosing to go to hell? So there has to be reason. There's a common answer, by the way. What you have given is also what most audiences have given me. And the reason for that is the nature of our mind. The mind says, if we go to heaven first and hell is coming after that, we'll make heaven into hell. <laughs> Thinking of what will happen next. That's how the mind works. Mind works looking at terrible things of the future, fear. And if we go to hell first, maybe we can find some condonation or get early out from there, or at least we'll have a better time afterwards. <laughs> but the law of karma, what happens when we create so much karma with our intentions constantly? Our mind is working all the time, creating karma. We create so much karma. There is no way it can be fitted into a repayment in one lifetime. That is why only some part of it is picked up and becomes our next life, not all of it. And what happened to the rest? It goes into a great reservoir in the mind. A big reservoir where it is stored for as long as the mind is going to live. And that karma is called the sinchit karma or the reserve karma. So karma is of three types. Problems we are born with, karman we create while we are here, since it's what goes into reserve because it can't fit into that one life. Where is sinchit used? Sinchit is used in developing our attitudes in life. Sanskars are built from the sinchit. So sinchit is a very big reservoir. And our attitude in life, our way of looking at things, our style of doing things is built from the sinchit. Secondly, Sinchit is also responsible for creating new lives where there is not enough karma to balance each other to for a human life. Supposing you had done all good as much as you could. I want to be absolutely good, biased, and do all good things as much as I can. And the next life based on that would be unbalanced if you have to be a human being. Then items can be picked up from the sinchit and put into the karma to make it life of ups and downs. Since it is used for that. Now who is using it? Who decides this? One soul given a role called, we call him the, the angel of death, Dharamraj. Different names have been given to one functionary who 
it is said we meet when we die who tells us what we have done gives us the choice between hell and heaven if both exist and then lays down allows you to see the whole of your life very rapidly that you are dying and then assigns you to a new form of life according to your karma i used to wonder i mean i was young i was wonder how we must be having a very good computer or something <laughs> to figure out one man has had interactions with thousand people in his life and now to fit in those thousand people once again to meet them where they can meet where a very big problem i i the problem wasn't solved till i grew up and discovered that it is not necessary to do any of those things the people are created according to the karma it looks real they all look real but the people are created by the karma the any any people any number of people of any types can be created to correspond to the previous life so it's not a big job at all when i discovered how consciousness creates our entire life including people the people with have karma with they are recreated and there is no problem of trying to figure out where to put them in the karma works very beautifully that way so this information and knowledge came to me much later how it is being done you can see it inside if you go how it is operating so it's very it's a very simple method because the whole thing is originating is stored in the mind comes out from the mind and become the real outside why i'm bringing up all these things is that the law of karma operates in this way what happens at initiation is you you do not go at the time of death to dharmaraj or the angel of death or anybody your master receives you at the time of death invariably that's also part of the promise of initiation when you die master appears and takes care of you no connection is a very big break from ordinary life the master appears the perfect living master who initiated you he appears and i have seen many people dying who were able to see master before they tried to couldn't speak and could tell master the right where go of course including some people in my own family and some outsiders lots of reports of people being able to tell us before they stop speaking master has arrived time to, for me to go and they go happily <clears throat> i'll tell you one interesting episode that is about dr julian johnson as you probably know julian johnson was an american seeker and there were some earlier initiates of great master notably the brocks mr and mrs brock were the first one to be initiated here by one kr singh an indian who came and settled in america julian johnson was affected by those people but he was a christian missionary and he got an assignment to work in india and he was posted in calcutta on the east coast in calcutta to do missionary work where he was talking about jesus christ and trying to tell people to follow jesus christ and be christians and they'll be saved but he had interest in finding out about the great master about whom he had heard somehow he had a feeling i would like to see him is he like living christ today or is he just another master teaching some kind of meditation or yoga or something this interest was there for some time then he wrote a letter to the great master master i am julian johnson from united states i am a missionary working missionary work in the province of bengal and calcutta but i would like to come and see you great master asked his secretary an attorney who used to live in jalandhar town about 25 miles short of the dera of bias he asked him that you write to him to that he is welcome to come and he should come by train 
the frontier mail from Calcutta used to come non-stop to Jalandhar and then it went to Amritsar, did not stop in Vyas. Tell him to come, he can stop in Amritsar or Jalandhar, it's better to stop in Jalandhar which come before the Dera Vyas and that you will receive him. You are an English-speaking attorney and you can easily recognize him. So Bhagat Singh, whose name was Bhagat Singh, this attorney, he wrote to Julian Johnson that the great master received your letter and he is welcoming you, you come and uh, you come to this station, I will receive you, I will take you to the Dera in my car. He had an old car. I'll take you to the Dera in my car and you can meet great master. So Julian Johnson acknowledged that on this date I will travel and I'll certainly be seeing you at Jalandhar railway station, railroad station. Then great master, without ever seeing Julian Johnson, told Bhagat Singh, let's play a little trick. When people hear the story, they can't imagine masters talk like that. <laughs> if they're real master, they do. <laughs> if they're pretending to be holy, they don't. <laughs> great master said, let's play a little trick. This man, Julian Johnson, will be expecting to see me in the Dera. I will come earlier with you and hide inside your house. So when he comes, he'll be very tired after a long journey. And you say, Dr. Johnson, you are very tired and you come, you come home with me. My house is just next to the railroad station here. We'll have a cup of tea and then we'll go and see the master. He will say, no, 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 I've not come for a cup of tea. I want to go straight to see the master. And you say, no, it's not necessary to go in a hurry. You're tired. He'll get irritated. <laughs> this great master is telling Bhagat Singh, before Julian Johnson has even left Calcutta, that he'll get irritated, but you insist on taking him to his house. In that irritated state, he will come with you. And then you say, Dr. Johnson, I have a surprise for you. And bring him to the living room. I'll be waiting for him there. This was well planned. <laughs> Julian Johnson arrived. He got down at the Jalandhar cantonment station. Bhagat Singh saw him, the only white guy, tall guy. And he welcomed him and took him to his house saying, you have to come and have a cup of tea. Julian Johnson kept on saying, no, I would like to go to the Dera Bias for the great master. Anyway, he persuaded him to come home, but he was angry at him. Why is he talking of tea and all? I've come for a bigger mission. But when he went home and he said, Dr. Johnson, I have a surprise for you. And he went in and great master was sitting there. He had already seen the photo of great master in America before he came. So he knew that the great master. He tried to sit on his feet. Great master said, don't take a chair. He sat there. Great master laughed, didn't say anything. He caught himself when his speech was restored after this big shock of a surprise. He said, Master, you took the trouble of coming here to see me. And great master said, you traveled thousands of miles to see me. I only came 25 miles. Welcome. Then he wrote a letter. Julian Johnson wrote a letter which I read. Julian Johnson, by the way, I was young but became my friend because I could speak English. I used to go to a school where they taught English. Julian Johnson wrote a letter that very night. He said, I have met this great master. Just seeing him and being in his presence for two hours has given me everything I could ever desire. If I get nothing more, I'm satisfied. That was the impact that great master had on Julian Johnson. Julian Johnson became a great disciple. And as you know, he spent the rest of his life in the Dera with great master. He traveled to some many places where great master traveled. He became a very great satsangi and great master changed his name also, gave him an Indian name also. And then the another lady had come also been through so many kinds of yogic experiences and then she married Julian Johnson in the Dera and became Mrs. Johnson. 
her name was elizabeth she used to i was young i used to they used to invite me all the time in the house they were living in a house in, on the side of great master's house and she used to take the peas out of the pods and store them in a jar and i was always wondering how the peas have come like that in our house they come in pods <laughs> imagine how stupid i was <laughs> and she would then make them uh, you know uh, put some butter and make them nice and i would eat them and i say how did they come into the in a glass jar <laughs> i still remember this well to cut a long story short i want to tell you that julian johnson died in the dera not many people know about it there was another man one mr mehta he was living in kashmir northern state beautiful hill station and great master went there two or three times during the summer and julian johnson accompanied him on those trips julian told great master i want to take your photograph in a studio and send it to all my friends in america the pictures they have with small cameras and all are not looking so good i try to find the best photo studio where i can take your picture so the picture the company the store was called mahata and company on the river jhelum there's a river flowing in sirinagar kashmir and that was supposed to be one of the best photo studios they had a retail shop facing the river and in the down there was the studio where they took pictures and the road was a downstairs the river was a little high so there was a bank so julian johnson brought great master to take a picture and so he went up this mr mehta was running that store so he saw the english man like many tourists used to come from america other countries to kashmir he saw another tourist has come and the tourist julian johnson says i have brought somebody i want to take his picture he said he's just trying to be naughty saying his picture he's probably brought a girl probably dressed up in kashmiri dress which is special dress and want to take a picture of the girl with himself possibly and he just saying his picture he he told his assistant who used to run the studio mr baba baba take picture of whoever he has brought so the baba went down to studio took picture of great master in the studio they are beautiful pictures then they were sent to development and they said will be pictures will be ready in 3 days so julian johnson came back after 3 days to take see the pictures and uh, mr mehta when he gave the pictures wanted to see if they are coming out good and he saw the pictures of an old man with a white beard he said what this is man you brought to take picture i thought you brought some beautiful girl to have a pictures what is this old man and julian johnson said mr mehta you don't know this is a perfect living master he said do you know this country has thousands of masters they all claim to be perfect and you have been fooled by another old man don't you 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 come from america what do you do in america i am a surgeon and a physician you are a doctor and you can be fooled by a man like that how could that be so he said do you know this is not real you are being taken for a ride these people they are just after your money they see you as tourists coming from there you must have a lot of money and they pretend to be masters he said no he is a master and i live in his dera now in bias he says what kind of doctor are you he says i i am doing surgery i am doing everything he said mr mehta said i have had a pain in my back for many years any solution for that he said well uh, i have some medicines in the dera if you like to come there i'll take care of you he said okay give me the address he got the address 
And he said, for only for treatment I'll come there, not for your master. He said, no, come for treatment. Naturally, you're not interested. So Mr. Mehta arrived and stayed with Julian Johnson and got treatment. Every day, Julian Johnson would say, I'm going for Darshan, a great master. Would you like to come? He said, no, 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 I don't believe in such stuff. In the evening, he would go, I'm going for satsang. Do you want to come? No, I don't want to come. After some days, he said, what is this nonsense that you run every day for so-called darshan of that old man and then you go to hear him? What does he say? He says he gives answers to all the questions. Do you have any questions? I have a lot of questions. I want to know how do we know he has knows something? How does he have knowledge? How does he have this? He said, why don't you write down questions? I'll give the answers. So he began to prepare a list of questions. And next morning, Julian Johnson said, I'm going to satsang to hear the discourse. And uh, he said, uh, what about my questions? He said, you come along with me. I'll try to answer them on the way as we walk. So he walked to Julian Johnson and kept on reading his questions. He said, read the next one, read the next one. By the time they finished reading the question, they reached the satsang. Julian Johnson gave no answer. Then this man, for the first time, heard the satsang of Great Master, and he was surprised. He thought Great Master was answering his questions. He couldn't believe, how does he know what my questions are? He has something. He's not an ordinary person. And he came back and said, Dr. Johnson, he's not an ordinary person. He answered half my questions. He said, you want to answer to the other half? Come tomorrow. <laughs> So he went tomorrow, got initiated, and decided to stay on there. He wrote to his family, brothers, everybody, I have found a master, I'm going to stay here. They said, this young boy has got a, made a fool of himself. We'll send the elder brother to come and bring him back. Elder brother came, he also got trapped. <laughs> the rest of the family got trapped. Now, this is an interesting story, but after several months' stay, Julian Johnson, one evening after meeting Great Master, came back and told Mr. Mehta, I am very happy I am going back home. He said, what, you going back to America? No, I am not going to America, I am going back to my home, true home. Don't tell me you are going to die. He said, there is no death. We just leave the body and soul goes to the home, true home. That's what I'm here for. That's what great master's given me this great boon. He told me. I'm going to go home. He gave me permission. Next week I will go home. He says, you know already when you will die? He says, of course. It'll be next week at this particular date. How are you going to die? Are you going to take some pill or something? <laughs> no. There is a man in the U.S. consulate in Lahore, and they have heard about my deviation from my own missionary work, and they are very angry about it. And he is going to come to admonish me and take me back and tell me that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, who alone will give you saving, and try to take me back. I will not agree with him. So there will be little altercation, but I'll be sitting on this chair, and he'll hit me. I'll fall, and my head will strike there. He's telling this to Mr. Mehta. <laughs> and then I will die. They will think I'm dead. I'll go home. <laughs> I said, this is the most weird story I've ever heard from anybody. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. That's how Julia Johnson died. They went to great master, should we file lawsuit against that man who killed him? No. This was all written up earlier. So this many people don't know. That Julia Johnson described his death is with such accuracy. That is why when we are initiated by a perfect living master, death is no longer something to be afraid of. In fact, if we meditate, and know that we can die while living, which means we can withdraw our attention, have the same experience we will have when we die. There is no fear of death left after that, ever. So, 
Initiation is a very big thing. Initiation is when a master takes responsibility. It's a promise. It's a promise. I have heard you. You called me by your arrangement to be on the list. You are on the list to go back home in this life. And some are on the list to go back a little later. I have just for my own, for own classification called them list A and list B. List A, who go back right there with, the, with their master. And list B, who will go later when they find another master. So the list A and list B runs like this. Now, ever since I mentioned the lists, everybody wants to say, am I list A? <laughs> I want to tell you something very secret, but it's not a secret because many people have heard it. <laughs> this is about, this is about, now please keep it confidential. <laughs> if you do tell somebody else, please tell them not to tell anybody else. <laughs> this is about the appointment of Baba Savan Singh as the next master after Baba Jabal Singh. I don't know if you've heard about it before. There were 14 people present when Jamal Singh told Savan Singh, you will carry on my work. Baba Savan Singh was at that time an engineer working in the building, the road department of the state government. And he used to come to attend the satsang from his business, from his work. He had not retired. And at that time, his master says, you will carry on my work. But Baba Savan Singh, great master, was a very clever man. And I'll tell you now from what he asks. He said, Master, why are you asking me to be your successor when there are so many more accomplished people sitting right here? Here are these people. They are sitting here, living here, doing more meditation than me ever. I ever did. How are you picking on me? And Baba Jamal Singh was a disciple of Swamiji from Agra. He said, let me check with Swamiji. Because he never took credit for himself. So he closed his eyes. And he, after a minute or so, he opened his eyes and says, new moj has come. Now moj means a new will has been expressed. New moj has come. Swamiji says, only Savan Singh will carry this work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then the great master said, Master, do you realize that you are living in a little hut here in the Dera? It was just a two-roomed hut. And I am living in a nice, beautiful, big house given to me by the government. And you want me to leave all that and live in your hut to do your work? He said, wait, let me check it with Swamiji. He closed his eyes. After a minute, he opened his eyes. He said, new moj has come. Swamiji says, you will have a better house to live in than the one you are living in now and not live in this hut. Baba Savan Singh was not satisfied yet. He said, Master, you say that people will come and you will have, I will have a lugger to feed them. Do you know my pension will be very little, even after I retire? My salary is not much. My pension will be even less. How will I feed them? He said, wait. <laughs> and he closed his eyes. The minute he opened his eyes, he said, new moj has come. Swamiji says, you will never have to worry about the food to be served in lugger. People will bring enough. And they will serve themselves. And none of it will be your worry. There will never be shortage of food in your langar. Then great master thought of another question, a bigger one. He said, Master, in your discourses you have said, a man once initiated will not come back for more than four lives in total. I am trying my best to go back to my true home in this very life. 
if I become your successor for the sake of those disciples who are coming four lives, I will have to come for four lives. Is that your intention? The Baba Jamal Singh said, let me check it out. He closed his eyes. And after a minute, he opened his eyes. And he said, new Moj has come. Swamiji says, whoever Savan Singh will initiate will not come back in his human life again. This will be the last life. And that's big news. Very big news for the disciples of Great Master. That they will not have a second life. That boon was accepted by him. And he said, I will do what you say. And he put his head on the Master's feet and accepted that role. Now, why am I bringing this to your notice? Because people come to me to ask for initiation. I don't initiate. I have never claimed to be a master. I don't look like one. I don't behave like one. <laughs> you have seen many masters. I am just a disciple. You should know this. I am just a disciple of this great master. From my experience as a disciple of great master, I can tell you with certainty, 100% certainty, he was a perfect living master. I am not saying just because other people said it from my experience, that he was a perfect living master. What I am doing now is entirely seva, service for him. I have no power. All the power is this master's. He is physically dead. He died in 1948. I, his disciple, am still alive. Though I am also now more than his age when he died. But he is giving me extension to do this seva. Many people don't even know that. According to my astrology chart, I should have been dead many years ago. People don't know this. This is all his work, his seva I am doing. Therefore, when somebody comes and says, I want initiation, I have no option but to check with him. Because I can't initiate. But if he says initiate, and he approves after seeing, and he's alive for me, as alive as he was in his body. It is only his power, only his approval, that counts for my doing the seva of evil initiation. Therefore, I always call it Great Master's Initiation. Some people have questioned, how can there be Great Master? He is not alive. He is not alive in physical for the disciple, but he is alive for the disciple with whom he is there 24 7. Alive in the same way as he was in the physical body. So that is why I wanted to make it clear. It's all his work. Now, this brings me to the important subject of seva. What is seva? Service. Service to the master, service to people, service to anybody. It's the best thing to do. Great master once said, which was very important for me, he said, a seva done with love and devotion is equal to meditation. I found meditation very hard. Seva was simpler and easier. That's why I always try to find a chance to have seva. I was this size must be six or seven years old. And master was sitting. At that time, there was no electric power in the Dera. So they had to fan him with a big fan. And Sevada stood behind him and he gave discourses and they fanned him. I got up on the stage and I said, I want to fan him. And the Sevada said, get down. You're too small for that. <laughs> Which was natural reaction of the Sevada. Great master said, give him the fan. So Sevada could do nothing. The fan was as big as I was. <laughs> I still remember it. It is a very big event for me. And I took the fan and I did Seva. What I am doing today is no different from that Seva. There is no good or bad Seva. All Seva is the same. No matter. Some people say, my good Seva was taken away by somebody else. No. <laughs> seva is Seva. Seva should be done with love and devotion for your master. It's a great opportunity. It's a very beautiful opportunity that seva can be done, love and lo devotion develops in you and makes your meditation more effective. 
instead of waiting long hours to get results with seva add meditation you have quick results so there is why i wanted to clarify that when a person gets initiation of great master even today the same rule applies the same boon still exists such a person does not come back into second life a very big thing i wanted to share this secret with you i haven't mentioned this before so that is why i said keep the secret to yourself <laughs> but it is something so immense i can't really properly describe it and this special boon was given to great master and the approval was obtained by his master from his master so that particular conversation showed how clever my master was to put all get all the conditions satisfied before he took over the role masters are unique people they are even as human beings they are unique they play games with us even in his radiant form he plays games and i enjoy it it's so wonderful to have a master whose love is so beautiful so unconditional no judgment ever never judges any action of his disciple and that is why what can i say i wish i could tell you lots of stories of great master but we have to call this particular event to an end i'm very happy that i could spend this time with you and share some really secrets which i normally don't do so this must be very special audience that drew this out of me so thank you very much we have prashad to be distributed and i want to tell you what prashad is prashad is generally an item of food we give it can be anything which is blessed by a master the blessing of a master counts a lot it does not the blessing does not change the molecular structure of this substance why i say this because in india i know many people started using prashad as medicine he has got a headache give him some prashad no no you should give some tylenol and this in whatever you have <laughs> and not give prashad for headache yes give the prashad otherwise for blessing along with the medicine so that is why prashad is that when we take it we remember the master and that builds our love and devotion so that is why the significance of prashad is we remember master and if if there is like puffed rice which we used to get and i suppose they'll give something similar here we took a little bit every day we remembered master every day we took it twice a day we remembered master twice a day so oh, here it is so oh, very beautiful it puff a little differently but will serve the purpose the same way <laughs> that i got prashad from great master before i give this prashad to you i'll get the blessings of great master for this prashad from my point of view it will have the same power effect as the his prashad to me was so that is why it's something precious for me which i will be sharing with you so take prashad use little bit at a time make it last if it becomes low and you are not getting an opportunity for a second round of prashad then find something similar and mix it with it and then shake it the whole of it will become prashad because you won't know which one is which <laughs> every one of that piece will then remind you of master so that's what we used to do i'm only telling you from my own experience that we used to take the same kind of thing it is available in the market and we used to make more prashad so i in the we have now started asking some sevadar to distribute the prashad on rare occasions like i used to do i used to give it personally now seeing the number would you still like to come to me personally and get it yes. how many would like yes. that yes. Yes. okay in spite of the problem of uh, arranging a quickly distribution of prashad personally we will do it yes. so i thank you very much i'll take a little break while they make arrangements for the prashad to be distributed personally by me and i'll come back 
and give you prashad one by one. Thank you very much for joining me for these three days. The, the program will end after prashad is given. Those who are still waiting to see me for personal time, I'll see them after lunch. Thank you.